Hi, this is Jeff, and I am frequently asked with 14 children uh, how we manage, how we do things, and how our children have ended up, you know, behaving so well in public and basically being productive teenagers and adults. And one of those areas is the job chart. So I thought I'd put together this short video to share with you how we approach it, and perhaps there'll be something uh, that we do that can be helpful in your home and with your family and with formation of children. So let's talk about a job chart. First of all, some foundational principles to cover that explain our approach uh, to this topic. In our family, it's vital with 16 members of the family, including uh, at the moment five teenagers, that there's a lot of organization. And I approach this with what I call conscious parenting. What that means is we're not just waking up and letting uh, every day happen to us and trying to react the best we can, but rather uh, very proactively thinking about and learning uh, from other people and establishing rules and processes that would uh, presumably help us to get to the goals that we have as a family, as individuals, and as people responsible for the formation of children. So it's a very conscious, forward-thinking approach. And uh, the organization of a big family involves parenting as if we cared about outcomes. Now, in a business, you have to care about the outcomes of your decisions. The things that you make influence the employees and the people you serve and the quality of your product or service. And if you act as though all of those things matter, then the decisions that you make should be aligned with those. If you work in the government, uh, or regrettably, if you work in the church, many people don't care about outcomes. And so they approach organization uh, in a way that basically guarantees that those outcomes will be poor. We can't afford to do that if we are parents and we care. So organization is vital. It requires a little bit more work at the beginning, but then it guarantees better processes and better outcomes. Also, communication is an, a very important factor. Communication between uh, spouses, communication between the parents and the children, communication between the children, and then communication uh, from the children back to the parents for reasons we'll see in a moment. That communication needs to be clear, can't be convoluted, can't be mixed messages between parents. It needs to be consistent so that that communication can always be relied upon uh, and children can learn that they're uh, uh, able to make decisions with confidence because they have a reasonable expectation of what the communication will be tomorrow and the next week and the next month. The communication has to be audience appropriate. Of course, we need to make sure that we uh, explain things in a way that the children, the child who's hearing it understands. That seems obvious, but most of us don't have a lot of training or experience uh, in communicating to a room full of, for example, 14 children ages 23 to nine months and tailoring the message so that the appropriate individual understands uh, the details and the scope of their responsibilities. And then finally, and this is very, very important, confirmation that that communication has been received and understood. I frequently will ask my children to repeat back to me what I have just said to them. And more often than not, they either misunderstand or they communicate something uh, only partially, right? So the job's only gonna be halfway done or it's, it's gonna be incomplete or it's gonna be done poorly or the, the wrong job is going to be performed. So, uh, and I'm in the uh, communications business and I work very hard at this and I still find that that's the case. So this is an important principle. Now, another key foundational principle for us in approaching this is the whole question of discipline. Discipline is vital. It's vital in a family and a team and a, a company and the church and business and the world. There has to be order and there has to be justice and discipline uh, is oriented to those things. So when we discipline, we have proportionate consequences to uh, the enormity of the offense. Of, of the offense. If, if the job was, was not done and it was a minor thing and it hasn't happened much before and the person is new to the job, uh, then you know, that's a relatively minor offense. Uh, and if the person is young, then that's, that's taken into consideration. 
if you're dealing with a teenager who's been doing these jobs for 10 years and it's a it's an important job and they were reminded and they still chose not to do it, uh, then that's that's a greater offense. Uh, and I would encourage you to avoid incentive based discipline. That is to say, uh, jobs should be done. Right. Jobs don't need to be rewarded. Jobs and chores are just part of their state in life. Uh, just like we don't, uh, you know, high five the husband who gets up in the morning and goes to work to support his family. That's his duty. Uh, we don't hold a parade in his honor. Uh, his wife and children don't meet him at the uh, at the door in the afternoon with a, a band and applause and all of this and cheering. He's doing his duty. And it's OK to say thank you. It's OK to be grateful. It's even good to be grateful. But uh, there's no need to applaud uh, and incentivize the behavior that is uh, appropriate and according to their state in life. It's also important to have high expectations. So uh, it's very unlikely that you're ever going to achieve something if you don't aim for it. Right. If you set an expectation that, you know, I, I want to uh, achieve a hundred and whatever you know, quantity we're measuring, uh, then you have no chance of probably of reaching 200, right? But if you don't establish any expectation or you establish a low expectation, you say, oh, I, I want to be, I'm fine with achieving a 50 on my test, not a hundred. Then the odds of you achieving the hundred are very, very much lower. In my experience, observing parents over the last two decades and, uh, you know, raising 14 children combined 178 years of uh, parenting experience. Uh, that's, you know, when you add up all of their ages all together, that's what that is, right? Uh, I've seen that people who establish high expectations for their children, their children are much more likely to reach them than those who kind of are lackadaisical about it. Uh, and they just kind of think that, you know, hey, uh, all things are equal and children are children and they'll be whatever they're going to be. Uh, their children tend not to turn out as well as many of us would, would like. So, uh, I always ask the question, well, what's the ideal, right? What's the ideal outcome? How should this person in this time and place and this age behave? What should they be capable of doing at that age? And keep in mind that the kids don't know any better, right? I mean, they might know that the kids next door don't do chores, or they might know that, uh, you know, a kid across the street who's the same age would not be capable of doing something. But generally speaking, especially in a large family, there's a lot of that culture being created internally and organically. If you set those high expectations, if everybody knows that everybody has jobs, it's just part of our duty from dad all the way down to the youngest child, whatever they're capable of duty, doing, they're expected to do. Once you've established that, the, the children just, that's just the way it is, right? And it'll be much later in their life when they realize, you know, hey, not everybody teaches their uh, seven-year-old to, you know, wash dishes. Not everybody expects their five-year-old to do their own laundry. And so they'll they'll figure that out eventually. But by that time when they can, uh, you know, recognize that disparity, they'll also be able to at least grab a sense of why this is a good thing. So uh, don't be afraid of setting those high expectations with kids. Also, once there's failure and there will be failure, probably frequently, uh, failure requires some reassessment. Was the child really in, unable to do uh, these tasks? Were the circumstances such that it didn't get done? Right? You were gone all day. Uh, you, you went to see grandma or you were at church and, and something you know, prevented that duty from being accomplished in its normal way. Uh, or was there poor communication either by you or the child? Or is there some other factor? And and it's really only when there is a demonstrated inability to perform it that you're going to reevaluate. And in that case, when you've come to the conclusion, hey, this kid simply cannot do this job. Sometimes it's obvious, right? They, they, they can't unload the dishwasher because they can't reach, uh, you know, the shelves where so much of, uh, of those items are going to be placed. Well, in six months, it might be totally different or they've acquired the ability to perform the job at a higher qualitative level. So these are the foundational principles that kind of are the background for our approaching parenting. Now, when it comes to the job chart, there's some additional principles, right? Understanding these principles helps to make the decisions about the specifics of the job chart. So we believe that jobs and chores teach children. It's not just about getting things done around the house. 
it's about learning obedience, right? Because the chore represents an effect, a command from their parents that they need to obey. It teaches them responsibility. The job chart helps them to learn to do things without being directly told. They're developing that understanding that they are under the obligation to check the chart and then do whatever it is that's appropriate to them. It teaches them the domestic skills that are important for boys or girls to function in this world, whether they're going to become moms and dads, whether they're going to go into uh, the priesthood or religious life, having these kinds of skills around the house is important. Uh, and also just the skill to be able to recognize that there's disorder or that there's chaos or that or that there's, uh, you know, there's a lack of hygiene, something that needs to be addressed, right? The, the dirtiness that's inconsistent with the kind of life we want them to live. Uh, it teaches them confidence, right? Once they learn that they can do things, maybe they've seen their uh, older siblings do things for many years, and now they're able to do that. It teaches them a sense of confidence uh, that will serve them well when they go out into the world, whether it's church or school or employment, uh, they will recognize, oh, I can step up and do that. It teaches them accountability. And all of these things are important because the truth is about the world that we end up being accountable, usually, to a superior of some sort. The earlier we start that, the better we understand it, the less resistance there is uh, internally, like in a prideful way, uh, to being accountable to others. So from a very early stage, they're learning this. And, and like with anything else, the earlier you learn something, the easier it is to master that. Uh, Remember that children are in training for the realities that they will experience in school and in work and, and in their life. So even though we're, we're hoping through this process to achieve certain outcomes, that is an orderly house, uh, we're also training them and forming them in a very conscientious way. And after all, if you do this properly, then they're going to become much better adults. They're going to be happy to work. They're going to be happy to do their part uh, in life. Uh, they're going to be able to set a good example for others. Uh, mentally and emotionally, they will be reconciled with the nature of work, the nature of duty and responsibility. Uh, instead of being social justice warriors and snowflakes who rebel at all of their duties, right? They're, they're rebelling against everything. They don't want to work. They don't want to pay their debts. They don't want to be accountable pe to people. They don't want somebody telling them what to do. So uh, this, of course, represents a failure of the parents of those uh, largely millennials, uh, to do exactly what we're talking about. Now, delegation in the home is a good thing, okay? Delegation will uh, allow us to perform at our best and highest good, really putting together our talents. And so an example of this would be that a dad should not be doing the dishes if uh, one of his child children can do the dishes. A mom should not be folding the laundry if her 10-year-old daughter can fold the laundry. Why? Because there are a great many duties, in fact, obligations that those parents can do uh, that the children cannot do. So, for example, the mom can nurse a baby. Uh, the 10-year-old girl cannot. So the mom can nurse the baby or she can teach other children in the house uh, or maybe she can cook. And the 10 year old daughter may not be able to do all those duties or should not do those duties. And, and we can think of many examples, of course, the the dad perhaps uh, needs and should work an extra hour that day to bring in more money for the family to support their needs or to tithe or to put the, the children in Catholic school or whatever the case may be. And so if he knows he can stay at work and work that extra hour doing something that his perhaps his teenager cannot do then the teenager shouldn't be sitting on the couch playing a video game. The teenager should be in there doing the dishes. So understanding this principle and helping to drive all of our decisions with this, uh, really it's an obligation to delegate, it's very important. Now, when you delegate, problem areas are going to become apparent very quickly. The children do the jobs sloppily. They do them in an incomplete way. They break dishes. They uh, don't put the laundry in the right place. There's going to be all sorts of things that you think are just normal and common sense, and this is the way to do it. And you've not communicated those things clearly enough. Your training process has broken down. You just have to accept that this is going to happen. And for some of you, this will be more difficult uh, than others. Just like in my own home, uh, it's more difficult for my wife to accept the lower uh, quality that comes with children doing things than if she were to do them herself. But you just have to accept this. Delegation is going to involve 
lapses in quality. And then those are just training opportunities for you to recognize, oh, this, this kid does a great job at it. I don't need to train him because he, he does a great job, but this kid really struggles. So I got to spend more time there. So it's management by exception and you're spreading that out. And what I've always uh, tried to do is push the work to the lowest possible level that it could be done. As long as I'm achieving what I would call an 80% score. So when I think about how often they do it and how well they do it and the lapses, are we more or less at 80% success? If so, we've pushed it to the right level. If they can't reach 80%, and that's kind of a, it's an arbitrary number, but it's one I've always felt good about. If they can't reach 80%, if they're like 50%, just over and over again, they're just that many problems. Well, then you probably pushed it too low and it's time to, you know, bring somebody else in. And so that brings up another point. Sometimes you just need to pair up children who need help. You take children who are almost there. They're on the verge of being able to do that job. And you pair them with a, a, an elder sibling who's already mastered that task. And so you're kind of dragging them along. And an example of where this might be the case, I mentioned uh, unloading the dishwasher earlier. Uh, normally one child would have that duty. But you might put two children on it if you have a young child uh, who's not capable of reaching the higher shelves, but you want to get him involved in that duty. So his job is to put away the, uh, you know, the flatware or to put away the children's cups. In our, in our home, we have a separate shelf for children's cups and plates and bowls. So you have a child who can't reach those higher shelves, do more or less half of the job. He's learning it. He's becoming accustomed to it. He's finding out what's involved. And then the older child that he's paired with does the remaining part of the duty. So you're starting to transition one out and the other in. And of course, there are probably lots of jobs where this might be the case in your home where you need to pair up children. Obviously, we're assigning jobs based on their age and their ability. Uh, we all know that uh, girls, for example, mature more quickly than boys usually. And so you might have a 10-year-old girl who can do things that the 12-year-old boy, 13-year-old boy, just isn't any good at, right? He's He's folding the laundry and it's just a disaster or something. So so sometimes you have to be flexible with that. They're, in my mind, they're not arbitrary, uh, hard and fast rules about that. And then finally, temperament is a real thing. So uh, we have, uh, you know, children who just struggle to get along. So if you're pairing them together or if one of them is, is dependent upon the other to do a part of his job before he can do, you know, his other job. Uh, in our house, an example of that might be that, uh, one child is supposed to pick up a room uh, that involves picking up toys and that sort of thing. And the other child is supposed to vacuum the room. You can't vacuum until it's been picked up. So the temperament becomes real. So you need to think through your job chart and assignments. Now, when you have 14 children, there's some you know, flexibility that's there that may not be there in your home. Uh, if you've only got you know, 10, 8, 6, 4 children or their ages are such that you, know, you just don't have that much flexibility, that's going to be an opportunity, of course, for patience and charity. Now, the other thing that's important here is that preferences are okay. Uh, you know, in my opinion, my experience of dealing with these job charts, dealing with assignments, it's not necessary that everybody does everything, right, in a rotation where every single person is going to do every single job because there are some kids who absolutely hate doing X job. And there are other kids who don't mind doing that job and they would be you know, happy to do that job every day rather than doing another job. So the bottom line is, does this work for the family? Does this work for the, the output in the home? And if so, you know, uh, orient the chart to those preferences. Now, generally, I would want each child to have some basic competency at all of the jobs. So there needs to be some basic understanding right? Uh, a daughter maybe would much prefer to fold the laundry and the boy would much prefer to clean the car or cut the grass. And that's perfectly fine. But that boy should probably know how to fold laundry. And, you know, the, the young lady probably should know, here's how you wash a car. Here's how you cut the grass. So she might find herself in a situation one day where she needs to do those things and vice versa. Now, the job chart more or less guarantees occasional disobedience and disappointment. But if you've got children in your home, that's already baked in, right? Uh, now, I'm going to cover the consequences of that disobedience and disappointment in a separate video because I have a lot to say about how we uh, track more or less demerits and reward exceptional behavior. So uh, this video is already going to be too long. So we'll get to that in a separate one. But 
there, there have to be consequences, of course. Now, the chart size and complexity, and I'm going to show you one that's designed around our home uh, in just a moment, but the chart size and the complexity of the chart is going to depend upon a lot of things, the size of your house, right? The uh, you know, are there other things going on on your property? Do you have a farm? Do you have a garden? Do you have uh, pets? Uh, you know, are there a lot of moving parts that have to be addressed? The number of people, of course, because that drives the, the duties, the size of the messes and, and the amount of the laundry and that sort of thing. Uh, the extent of the duties, right? If you have young children and you're just starting out with your job chart and you've only got a, you know, a four and a six year old, that's going to be very different than if, like me, you have uh, age 23 through nine months. And then the level of delegation. Now, in our home, you're going to see our job chart in just a moment. Uh, there's an extensive amount of delegation. We've really tried to say we want everything that the children can do to push to their level so that mom and dad are free to do all those other things that the children cannot do, like parenting, uh, taking that time apart for a child and spending special time with that one child uh, as a mom and a daughter or as a father and a son or uh, teaching, right? The, the children can't teach theology or economics uh, or the moral law. So there's a lot that the parents need to be able to do. So in our home, there's a tremendous amount of delegation. And then finally, I would embrace you, uh, encourage you to embrace technology. So when I grew up, my dad made a job chart for the six children uh, based out of a post, post, uh, uh, the poster board and, you know, color pencils and a, a line for that a ruler made. Well, that was great back then. But today, uh, I would encourage you to use Google Sheets and Google Docs uh, to organize. And the reason for that is uh, it's easy to change. It's easy to print. You can share it with your spouse and with your children. And um, it's, a, you know, it's accessible from anywhere and on any device. And so we actually have uh, our children can you know, log into a tablet or a laptop or a smartphone uh, and quickly look and see uh, whose job it is. Uh, because guess what? Uh, the job chart mysteriously disappears. It's been printed and posted on the refrigerator. And then one day we can see that someone has ripped it off and nobody can find it. Uh, and, and so having that there also allows you, of course, to make easy changes, uh, share it with your children, encourage them to comment on it and say, hey, I got this job twice in you know, one week or whatever their, their feedback is. And getting their feedback is important, too, because you'll find out uh, some of these preferences we talked about earlier. Okay, that's enough for me. Now let's jump in and take a look at the actual job chart. So here we are actually looking at the job chart for the Kasman family. This was last major update in July of 2018. And uh, so you can see the extent to which we have uh, delegated, not just uh, with, with jobs, but jobs that are to be done on a daily basis versus uh, Saturdays. And, uh, and so I'll just make a few observations about this so you can see a, a couple of uh, really uh, just formatting questions. So we have a four week job chart. We have determined after a lot of experience over the years experimentation uh, that a four week rotation, given the amount of the jobs and the, the daily responsibility involved in some of those jobs, that a four week rotation uh, distributes the jobs most equitably and gives people you know a little bit of time off from the jobs that maybe they don't like. So we have all of the jobs listed. Uh, we've delegated to you know the greatest extent that you know possible, uh, and then within uh, each uh, job, when that job is expected to be done, and then of course you have the four weeks. You can see here that we have doubled up on some of these jobs, as I explained earlier in the video, where a child needs that, or uh, where the job duties are just extensive enough that they require two people or where we need the job to be done quickly. So an example of that would be that the yard pickup uh, is a job that you know normally happens. The kids have been playing outside. We want the yard to be cleaned up. That normally happens right before dark and there's a lot going on. It's dinner time and you know preparing for bed and so forth. So we want the job to happen uh, pretty quickly. And so there we've assigned people that we think get along and they can do that job quickly. And those assignments, for example, include uh, discussions about temperament, who gets along with who, and then the age. So in this case here, we have a very responsible young teenager with a very young and sometimes difficult to manage a uh, young person. Uh, and then the, the following week, uh, this Paul and Maria are what we call the twins. They're very close in age and uh, relationship. They work well together. And then in week three here, we again, we have a 
uh, 16-year-old paired with a five-year-old who can sometimes be difficult to manage. So uh, lots of you know decisions and, and thought have gone into those pairings. But you can see here uh, a pretty extensive list of things. We've really tried to put things on it so that mom and dad don't have to think about what should be done, when it needs to be done. The kids just know. And so when they sit down for a meal, it's pretty much assumed that they've done whatever their, their jobs are. And there are also jobs on here that help to train children how to do things. So uh, for example, uh, you'll see here on row 23, uh, we've got somebody responsible for making coffee. Uh, I don't know why that says evening. We've got somebody uh, responsible for making coffee or somebody responsible for making you know, uh, oatmeal in the morning. That's out of date since uh, I'm on keto now. But anyway, you get the point. So uh, we have tried to make all these decisions. And part of the reason we want this to work like this on autopilot is because some days mom's going to have a bad day or mom's going to uh, be sick in bed and she can't manage it. And so a, a teenager needs to step up and he just needs to be able to point at the list and say, do this. And there no, shouldn't be arguments and disagreements about who does what and when. Uh, and so all sorts of things have been put in here so that people will learn. They learn how to uh, make coffee, how much coffee you put into the, you know, the little cup, how much you water you use, how you clean it out every day, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that when they go out into the world and they're serving someone, whether it's a, a boss or whether they're serving a colleague or whether they're hosting or whether they... Uh, they're at seminary and they're making uh, coffee for a gathering of priests. They know how to make coffee. They've done it before. They don't have to look around and say, does anybody know what to do? So that's a part of the process involved in making these decisions. Now, let's scroll down a little bit in this Google sheet. And I want to show you uh, something else that we developed that came out of a lot of angst and argumentation. When you put people on a job chart, you try to assign the job as best you can. But sometimes the kids will come to you and say, you know, hey, this is my heavy week. Why do I have so many jobs on this one week? Uh, or why do I have so many jobs and so-and-so doesn't have very many jobs? Well, uh, it can be tough to do when you've got a lot of jobs and a lot of people. So uh, I put a formula together that counts how many times a person's name shows up in a given week. And this helped me to see that the job chart was a little bit out of whack, that there were some kids who had a ton of jobs and others not. Or there were some kids who had a lot of jobs in one week and not very many jobs in another week. And you don't really want that. So another benefit of having this job chart in Google Sheets is we can see how many times that person is showing up in the job chart. Now, in this case, uh, I now can remember what's happened here. This job chart was built back in July of 2018 when John was out of the uh, house for a month. He spent a month uh, on an apostolate uh, working at the seminary doing manual labor. So we took John off the chart. Well, something has to happen. Those jobs have to be distributed. So John, in this case, showed up zero times. And in those jobs, uh, we tried to, you know, distribute them as best we could. Here you'll see an example of where, uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, this is obviously an old job chart because Paul had seven jobs in one week and only one in the other. And that that's too much of a variation. Uh, now, it is true that some jobs are very easy and it takes, you know, just a, a matter of minutes. Right. So uh, an example of that would be uh, watering the plants. We have a, a few plants on the front porch. They need to be watered. It's a very easy job. Everybody likes to do that. So this job uh, chart frequency does not track difficulty, but it does tell me how many times that person's name shows up on the job chart. And then over the course of a week, how many times they show up. And you can see that there is some bunching here in the middle. These boys, James, Peter, and David, are uh, uh, young teenagers. Uh, ben, an older teenager, John is now over 18. But Ben is going to have some more difficult jobs whereas the younger children are going to have less difficult jobs. Okay, so that's a little bit about how the chart works. Now, on a very practical standpoint, you can see that I've shaded the rows. That just makes it easier for the eye, once we've printed it out and it's on the refrigerator, for them to see uh, how those things work. Now let's take a look at Saturday jobs. So in a big family, big house, uh, lots of things going on outdoors as well, there are a lot of jobs. And some of those jobs don't have to be done every day. A weekly approach is more appropriate. And so here we've got a second uh, job chart with all of those Saturday jobs. So um, 
we're trying to balance out what happens when and so forth. Now, since this chart, we've actually started to divide up further. We now have Wednesday and Saturday jobs. And the reason for that is that some of these jobs, they just need to be done more often. For example, the boys and girls bathroom, it really has to be cleaned thoroughly several times a week. Uh, and then we realized, you know what, Saturday is such a busy day. We work all the time. It feels like, you know, uh, we never get that time off in the afternoon for kids just to play. So we, we started to shift some of these jobs to other days of the week simply because it just didn't matter, right? It didn't matter, uh, you know, when that particular task happened as long as it was happening on pretty much the same regularity. And then finally, cooking dinner. So it used to be that mom cooked seven nights a week and then dad started jumping in and cooking more often. And then we realized, wait a second, uh, we can teach these kids how to cook how to learn to cook a particular set of meals. Oftentimes it's the meals they like and enjoy, uh, or it's basic meals, uh, you know, might be hamburger helper, or it might be spaghetti or, you know, other things, chicken noodle soup that we make from, from scratch that some of these kids have learned how to make and they love it. So now we've distributed the cooking across uh, the week. So it's not mom and they're cooking every single night. Uh, and so I would encourage you to uh, apply these things in your own life. I hope you will find them helpful, and I look forward to your feedback. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. I hope it's been valuable to you. If you appreciate it, please share it with your friends and send me feedback. I'd like to hear what you think about the job.